Truck Show podcast, and these might be some people that you know uh, in no particular order over here. We've got our panelist, Aaron Kaufman, who is a fabricator, mechanic, hot rodder. He gained national notoriety as a member of the Gas Monkey Garage, and now he stars on his own show called Shifting Gears, which is awesome. We, of course, have Jesse Combs, a talented fabricator and racer who you may have seen on shows like Extreme 4x4, Overhaul and Mythbusters, All Girls Garage, and How to Build Everything. She currently holds the record for being the world's fastest woman on four wheels. Right? And the tall guy in the middle, Gail Banks, the OG American hot rodder, drag racer, and engine builder. His company, Banks Power, develops high performance parts for automotive and marine applications, gas and diesel alike. He's celebrating 60 years in the automotive aftermarket this year. Yes. Good up. And the ugly guy in the middle with the beard is Sean Holman, my co-host for the Truck Show Podcast. <laughs> he is an automotive journalist, the content director for Motor Trends Truck and Off-Road Group. And, like I said, is the uh, is a podcast co-host of mine. His favorite pastimes are uh, raising micro pigs and shaving sheep. From what I understand, right? <laughs> I'm going to spend some time digging on him tonight. All right, so what we're going to do here is, this is a little different than anything we've done before. I'm not sure if it's going to work, so it falls on its face, sorry. But the goal is to get you to drink with us and enjoy the evening. All right, so we've got a short hour with these guys. If you see a word and it's mentioned, the word on the screen, we're going to be changing things uh, throughout the hour, and if it comes up, you guys take a drink. That's how it works. It's a giant drinking game, as we learn about our friends up on stage here. Can, get can you get another bartender? He's going as fast as he can, I know. He's, he's working as, as fast as he can. We should have had like four, but you guys have drink all four out of the house here. All right. You guys ready to get started? Come on! All right, all right. Let me get an education man. So all of you four have been racing um, Gail and Jesse at Bonneville, Aaron at Pikes Peak most recently, Sean, you raced to the restroom last night. Um, <laughs> starting with Gail. Wait, 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 and the Baja 1000. Oh, you did race the Baja 1000. I, I told you I'm going to rip on you tonight, because I can. It's going to come back at me in our next podcast. Okay, so starting with Gail, can you share a lesson? Uh, you'll have his up, yeah. Can you share a lesson that you've learned racing? A lesson that I've learned racing. Got an there are no secrets. <laughs> <laughs> Jump in wherever you want. There are just. no there are no speed secrets. There's just knowledge. My, mine is or more of a lack of knowledge. <laughs> I, I love that when you go racing and you wear a catheter. So those of you who don't haven't been desert racing, uh, you wear a catheter, and uh, you can always tell the new person because they have a nice catheter tail <laughs> on the back of the racing suit, and they will absolutely step on it and snap you if you don't know what you're doing. So pro tip, what I learned racing after a very, very quick induct in, uh, indoctrination into racing was get some of that uh, Band-Aid uh, first aid medical tape, tape it around your calf, tape, tape it around your thigh, cuts that problem off. This right falls away. under the heading of too much information. <laughs> so too. Yes. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Sherlock. You're welcome. Try being the driver and then telling your co-driver, hey, you're going to want this, and then they don't use it, and then they make you stop because they have to pee. <laughs> that's, that's Aaron, I think you just perfect. have an increased cleaning bill in the race car at that point. That's why there's holes in the floor. Yep. <laughs> what I've learned from racing, can I say that? Yeah. Well, Slow is fast. Slow is fast. Slow is Absolutely. fast. Yeah, like if you start thinking about how you're prepping your car, you move methodically, you drive smart, you don't make mistakes, you don't get flat tires, you don't roll it over, you don't do anything like that, you're winning, right? So slow is fast. So you gotta know when I took, it took me forever to learn how to slow down. But once I started slowing down, I started winning. So, so gotta remember there's cargo pilots and fighter pilots, right? I'm kind of a fighter pilot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so sedans and coupes seem to be a dying breed. Um, as people are turning their attention more and more to trucks, SUVs, and crossovers, what do you think? Um, you do left you think out roadsters. A roadsters? <laughs> <laughs> what do you think it'll Disappearing take cars. to get consumers back to cars? Aaron? How long do you have? Uh, <laughs> so, I, to be quite frank, I, so some things I don't understand is everything's really turned more lifestyle oriented where you want to project what you want to do rather than go do it. And then it also seems because of the liability of the manufacturers, they also kind of look to limit our use of the vehicles in extreme ends because they really don't want to, it seems to me, these are my opinions, 
it seems to me like they, they going that deep into it, like having a car that's very high performance and asking you to do it or saying you should or could go do it, seems dangerous. So they kind of blend this all into this, you know, a really manila folder of cars, these kind of half hybrid car van stuff. And it's not, it's not, it's not exciting, it's not a lot of things. And I think that ultimately there's just a, they find that they're making more money there and that there's fewer and fewer and fewer of us that really do want something that is very on the end of the spectrum, that is either an actual station wagon or is on the ground or makes big power, is able to have big brakes or big wheels or an off-road vehicle like, you know, quite frankly, the Raptor is an interesting, you know, offshoot. It's like, it's, a, it's built for the enthusiast. So I don't know why we have the cars that we have now, but fewer and fewer of them are exciting, but there are some real big standouts. If it's not for all you people out here, you gotta keep us from moving to pods without steering wheels, please. Like that is the direction it's going. You're all gonna have autonomous pods picking up your kids, and it's up to us at, as SEMA people and enthusiasts. Can we hear a boom? Can we drink? Can we drink a lot? We, we want engines and we want to be able to drive it ourselves. And, uh, and I'm, I, I think we should start a campaign called Anti-Pod Campaign. And uh, should go. I, and I don't care about cars. I want trucks. So you know, let them die. Let them die. So I've had the opportunity to hang with a futurist for about 40 years now, a guy named Sid Mead. And uh, he just recently did something for Disney in Anaheim, uh, kind of a futurescape type of thing they're opening up there. And about 40 years ago, he predicted exactly what he's talking about. And I said, well, Sid, what are we going to do when all these cars are that? And he says, no, 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 Gail, you don't get it. The future doesn't just happen one day. The future is everything that built up to the word now. Which means we're going to have a few of those around, but we're going to have a lot of stuff we still know and love. And I'm going to go into the ground driving one of them. <laughs> With oh, I understand completely. Amen to that. I'm not ready. No. I'm not going yet. <laughs> but that's what we're all here about. Oh, I, I think largely the, all the people in this building, not this room, but in this building, have a feel a certain way that they express themselves uh, through their automobile. I think whether you spend 2000 20 or 200000 you you pick a vehicle that exudes something that you want the rest of the world to see in yourself or something that makes you very excited that when you drive it. And as long as there are people like us and, you know, large enough numbers, mm -hmm. I think there will always be some faction of that, but largely I see that, you know, it does seem like a narrowing. Uh, there used to be so many different more versions of automobiles, and now it's really, what is the most cost effective, and then when you take the options away, people just make decisions of what they have. Well, styling is driven by aero today. So they start to look very similar because the aero solution, there's one aero solution that's perfect. That's right. And then you style around that, whether it's a car or a truck. So what you're saying, every car should look like an F-104 Starfighter jet? Huh. <laughs> what's, what's odd about that is I had the luxury, I was at the Detroit uh, Diesels uh, not, not long ago, and I saw the, the truck of the future, the new over-the-road truck, and the interesting thing was to me was I said, well, congratulations, guys, you built a race car. And so and the thing is super light, and it's unbelievably aerodynamic for something that's that large. And so it's like from the belly pan to the air ducting around it, and the grill closes off, it's like, you built a race car. It took you all these years to just build a race car. You know, without race power. Without race power. That was the sad part. Yeah, that's where you come in. <laughs> There's this thing. It came from heaven one day about 50 years ago. It's called oh, right You don't have to tell them about me. <laughs> it's called a turbo. <laughs> Are you saying you can put either a turbocharger? in Dallas, anyway. <laughs> put either a turbocharger or Aaron Kaufman in your car? Is that your choice? Either way. <laughs> Yeah, you'll have to face backwards. <laughs> Talk faster. Hold that air. Love that speed. <laughs> Is the manual transmission dead? If so, what could bring it back? No. Thank you. No, it's not. It's not dead. If you look at certain performance vehicles or even certain off-road vehicles, the Jeep Wrangler has one of the highest take rates of manual transmissions in the automotive industry. Drink! <laughs> Drink! I feel like I set up for that. Drink! All right. Good boys and girls. Mm -hmm. All right, keep going, Sean. <laughs> nope, I, that was enough pontification. 
Okay, Aaron? Well, on the manual transmission thing, there seems to be like this growing need to disconnect from driving, like almost like it's evil. There's too much, like too many bad things you could do while doing it. And so it's like, it seems like they want to immerse you in your audio visual experience in the car. They're quieter, they're softer, the NVH has been reduced so much that's like right around your couch, which is amazing. Shifting a car is one more inconvenience that anyone doesn't want to be bothered with. So I do think that the, the chance of finding manual transmissions will get smaller and smaller. But ultimately, for I, I feel that in while we know automatics and we know that you know automatically shift for robotized manuals can shift faster, the deal is ultimately it's like a lot of times you want to be able to tell the car exactly what to do, and either that comes at a great length of tuning or a manual transmission. And so there will always be a need for it. I think that you'll just see production numbers that will come really really far down here. Yeah, unfortunately, a, a lot of people are discontinued them. Yeah. I, I've, I've got a, uh, a new Mustang with a 2.3 EcoBoost in it with a six-speed manual. And if they're going to do manuals, they have to make them shift like a car rather than a tractor. <laughs> I'm telling you, the clutch, everything is just severely disappointing. But I like manuals for the chassis dynamo. They don't back shift. Yep. They don't, you know, you can put them in high gear, lug them down to a thousand RPM and map the thing and see how that turbo responds. Now we're talking. <laughs> <laughs> when I have manual options, I prefer to do my pedal shifting. I prefer to be the one that's shifting and, and doing it. I like knowing when my shift points are. I like being able to downshift. I like that cool downshift sound, you know. I like being able to do that. And, when you're going into racing, like if you're doing street racing, that's a very important thing. Like you can't have the car do that for you. You have to be able to do it yourself because that's whether you're going to be winning or losing. But like when it comes to something like Racing King of the Hammers, could you imagine being on a rock ledge face up or face down and all of a sudden you have to shift and that's 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 going to break our win. Like we're not going to win because that we just can't do that. So every one of our race cars have automatic transmissions now. But when I go out just to go four-wheeling, I get out my Land Cruiser, and I, I will shift all day long just because I love the feel of it, and I'm more in control of it. So I think it's going to go away, unfortunately, because like Aaron was saying, it's safer to have an automatic transmission because there's less things to do inside of a car. Ooh. But in the same term, it's people like us that are going to be demanding and want to keep it alive. I mean, yeah. the Jeep is the number one selling vehicle right now, both male and female and they're still getting the manual transmission. So I don't think it's dead yet, but I think it's on its way out. I think I, it depends upon what it's related to. I also blame all the bad driving on the automatic transmission. Because yeah. I honestly think if all of our kids started by driving a manual, they would be better drivers because they would understand vehicle dynamics and chassis control, they'd understand engine braking, they would understand what the, what the engine and the, the vehicle is doing. And I feel like, you know, kids today, because of everything doing, you know, adaptive cruise control, blind spot, they don't have to be drivers. And I feel like a manual, I learned on a manual, I think a manual forces you to be a driver. And guess what? You can't have your cell phone in your hand, or your drink in your hand, or whatever. The, the first time that, uh, that I... You can? Well, you can. We can. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I feel like, you know, so many, so many people these days learn to drive on an automatic and never really appreciate the true experience of being a driver and being in a car. Who here drives manual? These are depressed show hands. Question. <laughs> There's some liars out here, I guarantee it, right? No? Do you? Good. What's the future? Wow. That was enlightening. <laughs> what's, what's the future? I didn't say I was nice. That just what, makes me happy. What's the future of that, hydrogen yeah. power? <laughs> if you were a car company and you were going to base your transmission yeah. decisions on this room, we would all. Wow. Every, there wouldn't be automatic transmissions anymore. I'm right. <laughs> uh, exactly. What's the future of hydrogen power, and is it a good platform in which to build a hot rod? Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> you have so, so I got one. Uh, eight or ten years ago, Germany decided that they were going to become a hydrogen economy. And we do a lot of work. You guys may not know this, but we do a lot of work, work through the decades for OEMs. We were the first guys to turbocharge a Buick for the for Indy in 76, for the pace car. Uh, you know, we infected Detroit with turbocharging back in the 80s. And you infect them so, with manual transmissions, Gail? I hope so. <laughs> so we do, we, we've done a lot of work for BMW, and they brought a hydrogen seven series V12, uh, non-turbo setup for us to test at high altitude. Hydrogen is very air intensive. By that I mean the air fuel ratio 
stoichiometric air fuel ratio is 32 to 1. That's a lot of air to burn one pound of hydrogen, 32 pounds of air. And when you go to high altitude, well, this thing made 420 horsepower on gasoline. Then you turn on the hydrogen injectors, turn off the gasoline injectors, and uh, made 270 horsepower at sea level. And we, we have a 80 acre piece up, up in the high Sierras that we use for high altitude test. Went up there, and the thing must have been about 180 horsepower. It was just done. So what do I think about hydrogen? <laughs> the opposite part of it, well, it's too air intensive. Number one, you'd have to turbo the snot out of it. Uh, secondly, there's no range. Third, to have range, it's got to be liquid in the tank, and to keep it liquid in the tank, you're close to absolute zero, it's that cold. And you have to evaporate liquid hydrogen to continue to chill the drink. Drink, drink. So the, hang, drink. the tank no. is empty in two weeks, and you've, you've never gone anywhere. But hey, Gail, just to chill itself. Can we be honest and admit it makes a hell of a cup of distilled water? <laughs> That's what comes out of the tailpipe. Yes, it does. So I take it over to Leno's and he's taking hits off the tailpipe. <laughs> he's drinking the water out of the tailpipe. There's well, something wrong with Jay Leno. <laughs> Clearly. A lot of fumes in his garage. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'll, I'll tell you, it does sound like you have negative feelings towards it. Obviously, I haven't done any of the testing. I haven't done any testing on hydrogen. But what it seems like to Drink. Me, <laughs> drink again. All right. <laughs> what it seems like is it seems like it, when it comes to alternative fuels, that maybe the... Watch out. Don't do it. Don't do it. <laughs> It's, it seems like when it comes to alternatives, I, I don't believe that electricity is a proper alternative based on the way that the batteries are manufactured, how fast the batteries are consumed, and then the motors themselves and the cars themselves. I don't believe that it's sustainable, and not to mention, you know, I say we're still where I have coal power, perhaps they're wind, perhaps they're, you know, they're solar. It's like, and then we have so many transmission losses to get the power to your house, into your car. It's like, I don't think it's viable. Um, I don't like ethanol in my standard fuels. And it's like, it does seem to me like hydrogen does it does seem on the surface like it's a good alternative. Um, obviously there's issues, but I think the, the architecture and the design of the motor can compensate for some of the, the problems with the fuel itself. Uh, it does seem like it's a reasonable solution, and we talk about no infrastructure. At one point there was no gasoline infrastructure. And so, what do you, t what do you think about that? You, you buy gasoline in, in a drugstore back, back in the day. I, 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 I buy my hydrogen. And blow it. Yeah. So, uh, have you seen uh, Russell Blenis, Blenis, he runs his uh, performance guys at GM. Have you seen the Copo electric Camaro? I've seen it. I know, I know what the engines can do. Sick and don't think that they're <laughs> wrong. <laughs> That's all I got to I, say. I've raced a few Teslas. I haven't won against one yet. So. <laughs> and it, it will both in where your LS was. It's like, no, it won't. <laughs> that guy at GM needs to be fired. <laughs> All right, what's the one vehicle you got rid of and wish you still had? Let's start with Jesse. <laughs> Did I stump you? Yeah, I guess you could call me a hoarder, because all of these years, <laughs> all of these Wait, years hey. I listen to you guys, and you're like, oh, I had this great car. I wish I would never got rid of it. I wish I never had. Like, I, I had some really crappy cars as I was a teenager. So you have them all? Really? No, I was really happy to get rid of those. I never wished I had any of them back. Though I did grow up with... Um, you will. Yeah, I grew up with K5 Blazers. So um, I wish I still had the one that I had in high school, but long term, we kind of have one back in the family because I bought one for my dad for his 60th birthday. But other than that, like... I don't miss any of the vehicles I got rid of. Like, if I got rid of them, it's because they deserve to be, like, burned. <laughs> like, like, I drove the pants out of them. So, you know, um, I still have everything else that I love. I still have, I still have my 2000 Toyota Tundra. And I've had, I've had it for all 238,000 miles of it. And, and it's changed, it's morphed, it's become something, and, and now it's my favorite free runner toy in the whole world. So, I haven't gotten rid of anything that I miss. Okay. Gail? Two cars. Uh, my mother's 31 Ford, she blew a head gasket in 1954, and my dad asked me to replace drink. the head gasket. Oh, drink, drink. <laughs> so it became overhead valve with a Riley Ford port. And it went from 40 horsepower to 105, and I thought I was a god. Uh, the other one, the one I really miss, is my 63 red on red split window Corvette. Uh, which held its class record at El Mirage. 
And uh, in August of 67, I went from just an engine guy to an engine guy with a California speed shop. And to put all the showcases and stuff in there, I traded the Corvette for some money in a 56 Bel Air uh, station wagon. And uh, I've missed that 63 split wind window ever since. Every time I see one, it's just, it's, it's kind of a emotional thing. Yeah, but you wouldn't be where you are today. I mean, how's your seed money for your business? And uh, 1,100 bucks, I got, I did it 1,100 bucks. <laughs> 60 years. Yeah. A lot of you don't know, Gail and I have a standing breakfast every other Tuesday morning. And uh, so we get to, we basically solve and all the- And David Kennedy. And David Kennedy, yeah. yeah. And we solve all the world's problems and then forget about them after we're done eating. So we have to, we have to do it again. I forget about them while I'm talking about them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for me, uh, it's, I had a 51 Willie CJ3A, flat fender, uh, had the original uh, flat head in it, a little thing ran like a sewing machine, had a, a Ranger worn uh, overdrive on it, so it would do uh, 58 miles an hour on the highway. And uh, the cool thing about that Jeep is all Jeeps look the same and people who aren't like us you just see it's a Jeep, right? So they think it's probably like a 10 year old Jeep or something. So you drive 58 miles an hour on the uh, 405, well when it's moving, not during traffic. And you're in the slow lane and cars and trucks are coming up on you at like 70 miles an hour honking and swerving and flipping you off and you're like leaning forward hoping you... That was uh, exciting every single time I drove it. Um, and then my other one would be my, uh, I had a Harley Sportster with a 1250 in it. And uh, it started out as an 83, had it all cafeed out, and I had clip-ons and rear sets, and it was a fun bike, but um, left it looking like an 883 for a while, so I would have all sorts of people want to come up and race me. And so I remember a Dyna CBO guy, you know, some rich doctor just got his Dyna CBO, pulls up next to me and wants to race, and he goes, what's in that thing, 883? He goes, yeah, come on, let's race. I'm like, oh, are you sure? Yeah, yeah, let's do it. And I smoked him. And at the next light, he goes, what's in that thing? It's not an 883. I'm like, yeah, you're right. And uh, that was one of my favorite. I mean, that bike, it was just super stealth and a lot of fun and, and uh, sold it. So anyway, those are my two. Uh, so I, like uh, Jesse, I hoard uh, stuff, but my stuff is junk. Uh, and so I've got, I've got a lot of old trucks, most of them blown apart, and then just the collection of crap that continues. Uh, so there's some things, some little tr trucks I've had. I was like, man, I really like that. I think about it. I was like, I probably didn't like it as much as I like the memory of it. And so, uh, but there is one. I had a, I built a bike uh, years before any of the TV stuff happened. And I was living in my shop, and it took me two years of trading labor for parts and swap meets, and I collected all this stuff. And I built this bike, and I planned to keep every bike that I ever built for myself forever. That was the idea. And um, so I built this bike, and I rode, I had it done. And so if it came chrome, it's chrome. If it wasn't, it was black. And that was, that was the financial situation, right? Anyway, so I rode it for a month, and then bills were due and so I put it on eBay the thing was gone the next day and I created it it went to port at Long Beach don't know Australia Japan have no idea where it ended up but I rode the bike for a month and I regret losing oh that was a sad situation <laughs> drink drink I'll be here. by the way they're still serving beer over here keep going so so that's so that's my one regret so I, you know there's one thing uh, I used to get married I used to get really attached to vehicles we'd have and I thought we're never gonna find another one this clean we're never gonna find another one this good and I was just like we can't sell it we can't lose it and then I did come around to realize that there are other ones there will be a better deal there will be one more rust free with more trim on it with more glass in it so I quit getting as married to them but that being said I have a large collection of junk um, so, but I do, I do miss my, uh, it was a shovel head, if anyone's curious. So. Something different here. Tell us about a hairy situation in which your car safety system saved you. Start with Jesse. <laughs> my car on, on road, off road, on race road, track, off road, race anywhere. Track. Okay. Just a, a point at which you go, thank God I was strapped in or the airbag went off or something. <laughs> Can it be a race car or does it have to Absolutely. be? Absolutely. Like, okay, so two years ago, I was out to set a new land speed record and um, I did 477 miles an hour and it was, it was a really good, solid run. Thank you. Thank you. I thought for sure it was the exactly 40th anniversary from when Kitty O'Neill set her record. So she set hers in a three-wheeled rocket car which, and it was on Alfred Lake bed, so it's the same place she set it. So I was in it, I was, I was going for it. And um, we were having some steering issues, and I was drifting left, of course, just slightly, but over a course of, you know, nine miles, you start drifting far, and the steering wasn't compensating. It wasn't going back to where it was supposed to. 
So by that time, I'm like, okay, I should probably, I should probably pull out of this. This is a really unsafe situation. And then the um, first, my, my speed brakes come out. I have electromagnetic brakes on the car. Everything seemed to be working Drink. okay. Drink. Yes. And then parachute one, my high speed chute failed to deploy. My slow speed chute failed to deploy. So I was basically in this missile going and uh, I, I couldn't stop. That's a drink, by the way. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah, drink. Yeah. And Aaron needs a refill, please. Yeah. <laughs> he stuck that thing dry real quick here. Um, and what ended up saving me is we have, um, we have just like a normal disc brake to basically huh. keep the car in position as we're moving it around at shows. And I burnt every last bit of that brake pad up and that rotor up. We had to completely machine a new piece. And if those brakes weren't there, I would have probably destroyed the entire car because there was like this berm of dirt and bush. I, we ended up in the bushes. It was, it was the first day that I probably ever thought that I was gonna die. But if I didn't have that one little brake lever, I probably would have been a goner in the car, would have been a goner too. So brakes, very important. Steering, very important. Parachutes when you need them, very important. <laughs> yeah. Anyone else have a, another story? Aaron, Sean, Gail? About where you were in a hairy situation, you're like, thank the Lord I was strapped in. You know, I, 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 is it, I've wrecked some- uh, is, that too, is it too morbid? <laughs> no, 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 I, I don't know, because for me, it's like, what's a good day at the track when you get out of the car and you go, I almost died. Uh, and it's like, <laughs> that was cool, like that was as bad as <laughs> and, uh, and all good stories start with, all right, but I almost died. Um, so, no, but I am, I am always amazed that the, the closer and closer we tailor the race car to our, myself, and then the more the ergonomics work, the, the better I get, the, the, the better the car fits me, which we are talking about safety equipment, the seat, the harnesses, the stuff that we wear, pedal position, car, uh, steering wheel position. So all these things, the better tailored it is, it's amazing how much better you can manipulate the car, how much better it responds uh, to your inputs. And so, then these are all safety uh, components. So so it's not that I, I think that I was ever like, gee, I'm glad I put my harness on today because, uh, you know, come on, I don't that often. <laughs> Tip them back. <laughs> don't you peek now. <laughs> uh, but no, so I haven't had a situation. So uh, I, I had one hit where I uh, got out of the truck and I didn't realize that I was so, the adrenaline was so much, I was like, wow, that was a really hard hit. And like, I feel really good. Well, the next day, I was like, oh my gosh, I have to get out of this bed, you know? <laughs> and it was, uh, it was incredibly difficult getting out of the bed and then finding the airport was in moving bags. It was a lot harder. So it's like, so the safety equipment had, it was, it was that bad with it. And here's the other thing, the thing I learned from, this is really what I'll say, your belts are never tight enough. And so, and then I used to think, oh, they're uncomfortable, that's good. Oh no, it's gotta be a lot tighter. <laughs> Uh, let's see, I've got one, I guess it's, it didn't really, I guess it was just my bad driving, actually. So, um, I used to work for a police department, which is weird, because I've been a journalist for 20 years. Uh, I was a police cadet, went to the academy, all that stuff. It was a rainy night, we were coming over to the police academy, we were allowed to take the police cars um, out to the academy, because we were doing, like, car stop and stuff like that. And so I worked at the police department, and I had access to a police car. And I was, it was raining, and we were hauling back to the police station, it was like one in the morning, and the on-ramp, if anybody knows, the Brook, uh, the 22 in Southern California, and Brookhurst has like a big fish hook in it. And I spun the police car on that, three complete revolutions, uh, didn't hit anything, and ended up at the limit line facing the light. And then my buddy behind me was like, dude, that was awesome! Uh, do it again! So, I know, I know, I meant to do that. Yeah, right, and, um, and so I still, every time I hit that off ramp, I remember that night, and I remember the car getting loose, and uh-oh, and just all the way through it, and didn't hit anything. But I did stop! No, oh, come on now, drink! You're cheating, you're cheating. Gail, do you want to contribute? Should I move on? You got one? Um, unfortunately, I... You're a safe driver. I've driven a lot of stuff and been strapped in uh, everything, including various types of boats, and never had that catastrophe. Now I'm jinxed. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> Does it work on particle? You're not, she's knocking on wood. <laughs> All right, what sort of technologies and performance parts are we missing out on due to governmental bureaucracy? Should we start with Mr. Holman? Can you ask that again? Because I, I feel like there are multi-parts to that. No, okay, what are we missing out on due to governmental bureaucracy? What are they, the government is not letting us have fun, right? Well, I'm just walking out in my garage and smelling the gas leaking out of my willies. Uh, now, uh, now you walk out in the garage with a cool car and it's like, eh, whatever, you know, so you don't get uh, the inadvertent high. Um, I don't know. 
Well, my, my opinion is, well, anyone cares, but my, my, my opinion We is, do care, Aaron. That's why we're here. Thank you so much. <laughs> so uh, I don't know that we're really missing anything out. What a great time to be a hot rodder. So the, we look back and we say, oh, the heyday. It's like whenever we were doing overhead uh, valves on our flathead motors, it's like, how can anything go faster? It's like when, as we start putting turbocharged up, we always felt like this is, this is it. Like, you know, maybe some crazy stuff will happen in the future, but this is the best time. You know what, so I love the history of hot rodding and, and eat, soak it up every time I get a chance. But ultimately, is now not a great Drink. time to be hot rodding. It's like you can go to the wrecking yard and pour four or 500 horsepower motors out and drop them in the same day. It's like you can buy uh, vehicles from the factory that are seven, 800 horsepower. So it's like, is this not one of the greatest times to be a hot rodder? Amen. So, you wanna go? Okay. Um, this might seem like a sacrilege. But I'm old enough to remember when there were no emissions controls. And uh, I loved the hell out of those days. <laughs> <laughs> but back around 1980, I was teaching an engine design course at General Motors Institute and touting the hell out of turbocharging and having a smaller engine and more fuel efficient, and it gets big when you push the loud pedal. And we had a fuel crunch in 73, we had another one around 80, we had a double recession in 80, 81. And uh, it was the dark ages of automotive, and some people ventured out, Ford did a turbo four banger and put in a Thunderbird, and then, you know, there, there was uh, Buick doing the 3.8 V6, and, it was all about fuel efficiency. <clears throat> In fact, Buick discontinued their V8 at that time. So, then it went away. Gas got plentiful, affordable, and cubic inches and cast iron were much cheaper than turbochargers. In fact, I was in a meeting at Buick one time where the Garrett guy, air research guy was there, and they were arguing with him about the cost of the turbocharger, which was around 63 bucks back then. And the Buick guy's argument was, that's more than the unburdened cost of our engine. I went, whoa, <laughs> you're kidding me, the turbo costs more than a V6 engine. Yep, and I went, okay, I get it. And we went off into big inch engines, and I love big inch engines. Now we know where GM got all that quality in that time period. You know, <laughs> engines. So, so, you know. <laughs> I, I was doing valve gear, gear research for GM on the big blocks back in the 70s and punching push rods through rocker arms and what have you and trying to work out the right spring rates and this and that. And I said, yeah, I, I, I'm going to need some parts. And they said, it's cheaper just to send you another engine. I went, man, these engines are really down and dirty in terms of, in terms of cost. But what, what has happened is, and there's, here comes the sacrilege, environmentalists have caused us to push engine management technology, turbocharging, small inch buzzing little mothers that make big numbers. You know, I'm talking 200 horsepower per liter in his truck with his EcoBoost V6 and an F100. And it's like, what did Banks just say? That we have to, the greens are the a reason we have all this technology? Well, they're a big part of it. That's a really sobering thought, isn't it? So I can't hate them quite as much. <laughs> it's, that's the thing, is it's easier to make it dirty, but whenever they, so I don't like rules. But at the same time, though, it's like it, it forces us to learn a new game. It, it forces us to become smarter, sharper about how we do it. And Elevates so, us. Yeah. And so the, the neat thing is, is that through what I think overbearing legislation, which I think probably comes from a good place, but I don't, they don't understand unintended consequences. But the, the one consequence was that we got sharper, is that we do, we make more power with less fuel, we do it in a better way. It's like we have DI motors now, we haven't even found the limits of what we can do with that. And there are some interesting things coming around the bend as hard and harder uh, legislation is taking effect. However, it's like the neat thing is, is once they leave their, their OE installation and 
we get them, then they're not so much efficient as they build big power. And the neat thing is, is race cars typically are very efficient because you don't want to waste the fuel. You want to get the most power out of every hit. And so it, does, it seems like it's gone hand in hand, although it seems counterintuitive that more legislation ultimately ended up this way. Because I wouldn't, I don't believe, I, I hate saying that. But, uh, but at the same time, though, I do feel like tighter constraints has led to better power plants. I beg to differ. I think Gail Drink. has a limit on lots of, uh, lots of engines. I've been to your place many times. Yeah, uh, finding power through emissions of coal. One more is doable. Oh, yeah. Is that the power? Oh, yeah, it's rattling off the words. They're drinking. Speaking of power, <laughs> the, uh, the air density in this room is 68.7 pounds of air per thousand cubic feet. If you inducted that air in one minute, 68.6 pounds per minute, on gasoline, you can make 686 horsepower. On methanol, you can make 700 horsepower. And on diesel, you can make 573 horsepower. What could you make on steam? It's all about... <laughs> <laughs> it's all about air density. Air density drink, hold on. Yes, uh, yeah, hold on. It's not a bomb, to, ladies and gentlemen. And that leads... Oh, is density one of the words? <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what is your idea of the perfect tuner car and why? Is that too wide? Is that too broad a question? So I'm a recent convert, honestly. And so, so obviously, so one of my favorite cars, I own a 36 three window and I haven't done much with it because I just don't have felt like I put, can put the time into it. So my heart is in is old iron. However, I've recently, we've built a couple import stuff and like, I'm really enjoying it. And so it's like, for me, it's like, I'm sorry if anyone has a front wheel drive car, but I'm still not there yet. But rear wheel drive, <laughs> and, and the other thing is, is I absolutely love straight sixes. And so straight six, Big turbo, rear wheel drive, you have my attention. I don't care what continent it came from. So <laughs> That's funny, because you just like laid out a bunch of stuff. I know exactly what you're talking about from my visit to your shop, but it's like, okay, all right. Uh, tuner car. Um, so as much as I love V8 rear wheel drive, that's, that's obviously the holy grail of, of uh, American driving experience. I did dabble in the import scene for a while. Uh, and eventually got tired of going over speed bumps sideways, so I got back into trucks and off-road. Um, I had a 2000 Civic Si with a V16 in it, and it was lowered with Integra Type R springs, and had a plus zero tire conversion on it, and that car was so much fun, it was so neutral. I would take it out to, to NASA race days at Button Willow, which is a racetrack in California, and I would pass everybody in the corners, and they'd get absolutely slaughtered on the straights, and I'd go back and pass them again in the corners, because that car was so much fun. Um, but I always, I never built one, but I always wanted to have like a, a Hatchy or a CRX with a B18 uh, in it from an Integra. Just because such a sleeper car, so light, so nimble, so much fun, and, and there's so much you can do with those old Hondas and uh, the, you know, ton of aftermarket support. So as, as much as in my youth I think I wanted to have like a town car with a 5 liter to put all the Mustang stuff on it and go, I'm obviously big about you know, sleeper vehicles. Uh, I still think a uh, whole Honda Hatchy with the V18 would be pretty bad. Pardon me, I was, I was asleep on that. Yeah. <laughs> Does a tuner car have to be foreign? That's it. That's the question, isn't it? Does a tuner car have to be a new car? No. So, one of my old SS 454 pick, pickups is, is the one with the plastic interior in it still. He, so Gail has he had three of them. He has two left, and there's one that still has the plastic over the seats. And it was parked in the corner of his shop, and it's a black, it's a black 454 SS. And I was walking by one day, and I was like, "Oh, what's that?" You know? And uh, I, I snuck a seat. Did he slap your hand down and go, "Get away from that"? No, he wasn't. He wasn't around. I just oh. walked by, and I was, I was unescorted at the time. So I sat in it. It was awesome. And then I told Gail, "Go, all right, tell me about that." So, L5P Super Turbo. So you have the Super Turbo in the dragster. Which is a Duramax V8 with a I turbo and a blower. I want to do a tuner, half-ton, short bed Chevy, uh, and I want to all-wheel drive it. You can say you have no plans of keeping that thing straight, do you? <laughs> <laughs> if you all-wheel drive it, you can keep it straight. That's the problem: it, is getting getting that to happen with ride heights down where I want it. But pickup trucks aren't supposed to handle the 
and making one that's badass and handles and it's a diesel and it's got a blower and it's got intercooling and two turbos and all I heard was just a bunch of work. <laughs> I, just, I, didn't, I didn't hear I didn't hear can't anywhere. I just heard then, hours. Then, yeah. But, <laughs> but meanwhile, I think of the fun. Then oh, yeah. you can do your inline six and I'll do my V eight. We'll all I screw with each other. It's the mechanical symphony you know, of a blower and a turbo. The only, the only question is, do I drive to Dallas-Fort Worth or do you drive to Azusa, California? Or do we meet in the middle somewhere? I'm, I'm down. We can do it anywhere. Yeah, all right. <laughs> That'd be a lot of fun. All right, you want to move on? All right, next one is, uh, name one of your mentors and explain why mentorship is important. Gail Banks, Eric Kaufman. <laughs> Well, that's just cheating. No, well, <laughs> mentorship is super important, and I didn't really realize that until the last probably five, ten years of my life. I didn't realize how much of a, a mentor this guy was. I mean, I built with him one of the first ever twin turbo Duramax engines way back in the day, and I thought that was the coolest thing ever, and I learned so much from this Wasn't guy. Wasn't that in the Humvee? Yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah the Suburban Gorilla. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> It was, and and it was, and I didn't realize how much I learned from him in the few days that we were filming together and going to his shop and seeing all of those things. And now, all of these years later, that was what, 14, 13 years ago. Yeah. And now, when I see him, like I can, I can legitimately have a normal conversation with him. I can ask these questions of like, what does it take for him to go from the levels of which he has? Because I don't know if you guys know this man's history, but this is he's amazing. He has done everything that you could possibly think of that has anything to do with power. And so being able to have a normal conversation with somebody like this can put you above the rest of everybody else. But it's not just people like Gail Banks. Like I have people that have been in marketing for, for Vans shoes for the rest of you know, for their whole life. And I learned so much from them. It's, it's being able to sit down and listen and absorb the information that they have, what they've learned, listen to their failures so you don't have to go through that again. The mentorship is so important. Unfortunately, all of my mentors are no longer with us, uh, with, with the exception of one, Ed Iskandarian. Um, and you can't turn off Ed Iskandarian's mentorship. It just, there's no off switch on the man. Early 90s. Um, you may not remember, remember this, but I met you at WyoTech. You were doing a project vehicle there with Chip. Yeah, the Speed Air. Yeah. yeah. So that's all the way back. I mean, even before, yeah, I was yeah. in school. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, mentors are incredibly important. Uh, you may not realize this if you're younger, uh, but it, it, and it, it's a two-way street because as an older guy now, you know, I'm pushing eighty. You you got a deal where you tend to get conservative, and there's nothing like sitting in a conversation with a jackass like this guy right here. <laughs> and having, you too, <laughs> having him shock the living hell out of me with, you what? You're gonna do what? Put what on what? That, well, wait a minute, that could work. <laughs> so, mentorship works both ways. And, uh, you know, it seems to be coming into vogue to talk about that word, but, uh, Mentors. Yeah, you guys drink? Yeah. It's, it's said it's, like eight times already. It, it's drink it, once. It, it, it's the key to my success. People through my whole life have pushed me up. But you've got to return the favor. And you've got to allow it, too. Well, yeah, there's that. Because we can be young and dumb and be like, no, I already know everything. I'm not going to listen to anything that you say, which is a lot of us. I was Fatal one error. of them. Yeah. And when you actually start learning and listening and paying attention, and like I said, slow is fast, you start listening to what they have to say, you can learn a lot more than you ever can read in a textbook or on the internet or wherever. It all comes back to cars. Turn right to go left. Right. <laughs> it sums it up right there. Yeah. My, my experience with uh, mentorship has been interesting. I've had several guys that were generations before me, um, different levels of skill, different capabilities. But I always figured if someone else could do it, I could do it too. And so I would ask all the questions. And luckily, and this is just, I don't know how I was blessed with this, but I've had some of the most amazing people around me. And uh, passion can be snuffed out. It can be crushed. 
But the, if you have, or think a real mentor is someone that fosters the passion and they make you want to do it more. They encourage the things that make you want to do it. They may not understand your ride, but they encourage your ride, whatever direction you want to go. And then they try and, you know, uh, you know, give you as much information as you're willing to take or as much as your sponge will take. And so that's one thing is I, I've really not been in a position other than potentially sometimes with my guys that I work with uh, to help them find those things that they're looking for. But past that, I haven't had much of that opportunity. I'm quite young, I believe. But the, many, many of the guys that I've worked with that are from previous generations, it's like I just couldn't soak up enough of it. And I've, I've come to find that I don't always agree with some of their reasoning on things, but I appreciate the, the, you know, the education that they endowed me with, the things that they showed me, because it might have taken me months or years to learn those things, but they expedited that. And I think that that's made all the difference in the world, as many of them encouraged me to do as much weird stuff and as much strange things and find out as much as I wanted to. And then I think that's made all the difference in my automotive career is that they said yeah I think you should but if you do I would consider these things and it's and everyone has pushed me to try 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 and I think that's the biggest thing is is actually encouraging the passion as opposed to saying it can't be done that is I mean that is a fire word for me to say you to say you can't there that will be the first thing I do you know and so uh, you know for me Mentorship has made such a big impact and it's been so many people it has been one or two but it's been so many people that I thought you know, also that had so much information, so many things to give. But one of the craziest things was I think about their where their situation. What did they develop? Where were they at? And so I look at things and think, oh, well, where can we go? Or what's left on it? Well, they must have felt the same way, and they found a way to break through. And so I'm encouraged. Like I can't let them win. Like I have to find mine all the time. So. Uh, for me, it, it's two. It's twofold. Um, I think that in this country today that we don't do enough of vocational education. I think vocational education has been pulled back from the schools. I think our young people suffer from not having a, a vocational type educational uh, person mentoring them in schools. For me, it was Mr. Sprang, and uh, Mr. Sprang was my auto shop teacher. And I don't come from a family that's a car family. My mom and dad owned appliances. They had Toyota uh, minivans and Honda Accords and uh, no idea where the generation you know, thing came from where I, I became a car enthusiast. But I was always a car person. I was dragging my dad around to every car show, and we would walk away with every free poster and brochure ever, and I had like thousands of pounds of this stuff in my room from years and years. But Mr. Sprang and I were, he passed away last year, unfortunately, um, but he was, he was the person who, who allowed my creative juices to flow, who uh, allowed me to, to love cars, gave me an outlet in a place where I, I didn't have it otherwise would let me, I remember the first time, I went to high school in the early, early 90s, and the first time we had a donation to our auto shop that was a wire feed welder and a plasma cutter. And this is cutting edge technology. What do, what, what do us jackasses go and do? We weld brake rotors to the stores of donated cars because why not? Let's see what it does. <laughs> we were carving our initials in things. I remember one time we'd get these donated cars, and uh, I remember one time we, there's 20 of us, thought it would be funny, it was an old Pontiac Bonneville, like a 78, late total land yacht, right? And I remember we all got under and we're like, do you think we can push it over on itself? So Mr. Springs inside on, on the phone and all of a sudden there's like 20 of us, we're pushing, we're pushing, we're pushing. The car goes vertical and thank God none of us got crushed, but we pushed it all the way over. You know, it sounds like a dumpster landed from the sky, right? <laughs> Mr. Springs comes up, dude, dude, what are you doing? And you know, you would do stupid things like that in auto shop, but you had the outlet and he would, he would mentor you, he would counsel you, he would, he would tell you why you're being dumb and then redirect those energy into positive things. And we maintained a friendship uh, the rest of my life and I, and I owe my outlet and my love of automotive, my career in automotive, 20 years, to, to him. And the other person who I consider a mentor is the man sitting to my right. And like I mentioned earlier, um, we have a standing lunch or a breakfast every other week when, when our schedules allow. And I've been so blessed to get to know him. He's been to my house, I've been to his house. Um, love this guy right here. To, to be my age, and my, my friend David Kenny from NHRA, who we mentioned earlier, where the three of us can sit down with Gail and see his excitement at Banks 2.0 uh, on a guy in his late 70s and getting excited about his business. And he goes into his business every single day and works every single day, doesn't take a day off. He's in the gym in the morning, he's working all day. Uh, it, you know, I talk to Gail all He goes the time. to Gold's gym like three times a week. This well, time. what's funny is, or <laughs> I'll text Gail, like there'll be something that happens, right? And I'll text Gail, it might be 10 o'clock at night and I get a response. And so I'll be sitting there texting Gail, my wife will go, who are you texting? 
Look What's your deal? deal? <laughs> <laughs> so I just just having a guy like like Gail who who's in my life and and to hear his stories, to hear his, his successes, his challenges, his pitfalls, just to hear what happened when uh, when you know I wasn't around then, right? And and to understand like how this automotive enthusiasm and, and what we all love to do, how it evolved and why how we got to today. And it's amazing. I'm, I'm blessed. So, so definitely, I, I'd like to just everybody has a beer, uh, especially the vocational teachers. Just want to lift one up to oh, yeah. all of them and, and take a drink because we don't have enough of that. And and I hope to God that uh, that those things change and, and we get back to teaching kids blue collar skills, especially in automotive. So, cheers. Well said. Well said. So just to close out the mentor thing. Um, when you get old enough and you've screwed up enough times, you're a good mentor because you know how not to do it. Or how to fix it. That's the, that's the only benefit, I think. Yeah. That's fireworks, I hope. Yeah. <laughs> Although it is Vegas, so I don't know. <laughs> what piece of advice would you give to someone who wants to open their own performance shop or manufacturing company? Should we start with Aaron, since you're relatively new at it? I don't have any advice for him, so figuring it out. Um, you know, it's been one of the, um, so, so, so much of my career has been building hot rods, this part for this vehicle to do this job, and then moving into, attempting moving into the manufacturing scene, is we have to have such a different design intent, which is something I never considered before. And like, and it's been, and there's been so many new challenges in, in my new version of my operation. And, uh, whoa, man. Uh, talk to a lot of people before you do it. There's a lot of things to learn and a lot of things you don't think about. So it's like this new version of manufacturing has been as big a learning curve as learning how to do everything I did before. It's just as challenging and you have to think about things in a completely different sense. And so that's been, I don't have any words of advice because we are on the daily trying to figure it out. But uh, it is one of the coolest rides I've been on is trying to understand these things and taking on this new challenge. And it's like while it's not a bigger wheel, a bigger brake, a lower suspension, go more just lateral G, it's a completely different ride and it's 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 been interesting and the automotive world can be a tough place uh, particularly non OE type stuff it can be difficult to find the dollars to be able to make it make ends meet but ultimately when it does work nothing's more rewarding I, I can't think of anything that's more working than making all the connections you know, connecting all the dots just doesn't happen as much as I'd like, but at the same time though, what a wild ride. And I definitely encourage it. It's like, there's a lot of things about business to learn, a lot of things about manufacturing process, and then you have to be good at building hot rods at some point because you have to understand what it is you're manufacturing. And your hot rod can be a Jeep or a giant truck or on the ground or a race car, but ultimately a modified vehicle. And so I feel like, I, my only word of advice is, I think that if you feel like it's in your future, yeah, I think you should attack it with everything you have because the last thing you'd want to do is lay in your, you know, your deathbed and think, I coulda, I shoulda, I woulda. And so I think that if you think you have it in you with some good research, I think that you, everyone should pull the trigger. And I think there's a lot of seats at the table. It seems like there's always a lot of saturation, but I do believe there are a lot of seats at the table. I would just say from, uh, I've never started a shop or owned my own business but from the media side and being in journalism and covering countless shops, more than I can you know, I can even remember, some that have been successful and some that have failed. I think the thing that I've seen in the shops that have been successful is an absolute drive and passion not to fail and to give up everything for your dream and to not let the naysayers or the negativity get in the way of, of your of your plan, your business plan or, or what you feel is right for you. Um, I think on the ne on the on the, the the other side of the coin, I've seen people be over ambitious or not understand the market or try and do too many things at once and not find that white space that they fit in. And really a lot of it comes down to marketing and, and not getting your message out and your marketplace differentiation and, and who you are as a company. I think half the time of somebody choosing to buy your product as a company is your story. And I'm always amazed that if I go on a website or I, or I go to find a new product or, or a new company that I've never worked with before, either personally or professionally, I always read the About Us page because the About Us page tells me more about that person, their their lifestyle, their their desires, who they are as people. I want to work with people that are like family. I want to work with people that are like-minded. Uh, I don't want fleeting people or flaky people or or you know whatever. And so I, I feel like find your story, tell your story, make sure people know your story because if your story gets out there, people are going to have an attachment to you and they're going to have 
um, they're, they're going to be invested in you and invested in who you are. And if you find common ground, those are your customers, those are your people, those are the people that are going to support you. You don't want to be married to the, the ones that are going to give you headaches who think that they gave you $10, and so now they own you for the rest of your career and are out haunting you on Yelp or reviews or whatever. Go after your people and be true to who you are and make sure you get your story out there. That would be my advice. Okay. I've got a variety of uh, hooks here. The first one is financial. Uh, I, I grew my business slowly uh, and kind of ran alone for a couple of years and then started hiring p folks. But one thing I did was I paid my bills. And when I say I paid my bills, I paid my bills once a week. And I had a checking account. Everything that was on the shelf in my speed shop was paid for. So if I looked at the money I had in my checking account, that was mine. So if it was going up, because I didn't take much out, if it was going up, I was making money. I, I wasn't blessed with an accounting education here. So don't overextend yourself. Be patient. The second thing is, and, and do good work and, and charge what you're worth is the second thing. Don't give it away. Uh, don't overcharge, don't get me wrong. But so many folks are not confident uh, enough to charge what it's worth. And I'll, the last one is, don't be afraid to ask for the sale. After you've shown the customer what will fill their need, and do a good job, and you've priced it, ask for the sale. Now, I've found in my life, three out of 10 times, I made the sale. And seven out of 10 times, I was told no. Then I asked for the sale again. Then I tried to find out what the true objection was. Then I worked at it enough that ultimately, I sold half, 50% of the people I talked to. That's pretty damn good, I've learned since, but I aggressively went after it without being aggressive. And I found the true objection, and sometimes the true objection was, my wife won't pay for that. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'd start scheming with them, how to work that. <laughs> so what does she need on her vehicle that we can do first? So, <laughs> exactly right. So the deal is, if you're selling, don't be afraid to be told no. You have to go through those no's to get the yeses. And then market to women. <laughs> Indeed. 50% right there. I have always. Your sales all to women. I, I they tell carry you. the textbooks. It's, it's a true story. You look, at, you look at a lot of the marketing plans and strategies that people have had in the past, and let's take Harley Davidson, for example. The moment that they start marketing to the women, their sales went up 200% because they literally are the ones ladies make they the make the decision. purchase decision yeah in any, in any well, good marriage they make the purchase. and i i see i've been in shops where a husband and wife will walk in and the shop owner spends time with the husband not knowing that the wife is the ultimate decision maker oh i get it all the time and, and i think that's a mistake i think you have to approach them as a couple and make sure that you engage with both people yep. and I, i'll sit there at the counter and i'm just like no nope. yep screw that one up yeah <laughs> yeah the only bit of advice that I have is just hire good people and treat them with respect because they will be there for you forever. They will be, they will, I don't want to say they'll become your best friends because the people that work for you, you want them to continue to work for you. But once you have that good person, pay them well, treat them well, and they will be loyal to you to the day you die. And if they move on. Yes, support them. Absolutely support it and be joyous. Be proud of what you, you know, talk about. Yeah, because, because you're spreading their wings. your mentorship, yeah. probably that's good on you and your business that people are leaving your business to go out in the world and be successful. We, we used to keep a record when, uh, of the graduates, we call it. And in 60 some years, there's 